In this video, we're going to be talking about Suguru Geto of Jujutsu Kaisen and his evolution into destruction. As far as we can tell, Geto's upbringing must have been pretty normal. He attended school along with Satoru and Shoko, causing trouble for Yaga Masamichi, sure, but otherwise not displaying any issues. He certainly didn't have the same kind of burdens that the Zenin clan or the Kamo clan members have revealed to us. Even through conversations he has with Gojo, we can see that Geto held a positive view of the world, and he thought it was important for the strong and those capable of protecting to be there for the weaker people in society. But at that time, we still see that Geto has a bit of a temper when it comes to his beliefs. Regardless, Geto held jujitsu users and his fellow sorcerers in high regard. He respected them and enjoyed fighting alongside them. When he and Gojo are given the special mission to accompany the star plasma vessel to Tengen so the immortal can merge with the young girl, Geto accepts, albeit with a hidden agenda. From the get-go, he and Satoru plan to let Riko go back to her regular life, if that's what she wants. In part, this is because because of their belief in having people be free to choose their path, but also because Yaga hinted at not agreeing with the assimilation ritual. Sure, it only comes up every 500 years, but at this point it gets both tedious and unfair to the young women being erased from existence. With that in mind, Geto goes through the motions of protecting Riko, accompanying her, and even forming a bond with her and her maid Kuroi in that short period of time. The problem is the two groups getting in the way of their role as bodyguards. Q and the Time Vessel Association. When Toji is hired by the non-jujitsu sorcerers, in part because they can't fight, but also likely to prove a point, the same way Toji wants revenge for his treatment, things start to take a turn in a bad way. After Toji puts a bounty on Riko's head, Geto's forced to be more aware than he's ever been of possible attacks. His powerful curse technique is put to the test like never before. But then again, this isn't a normal task. This is something that only comes up every few centuries. And it doesn't help that Tengen has amassed such a huge following due to their age. As time passes, and a little Okinawa break happens, Geto lets his guard down once inside Tengen's barrier. In fact, so does Gojo who is on the receiving end of a deadly attack. Even though Geto doesn't want to abandon his friend, he has a mission to finish, and he trusts Gojo more than anyone else he knows. So he brings Riko and Kuroi down into the tombs of the Star Corridor to meet with Tengen, but not before offering Riko the chance to resume a normal teen life. And yet, that's cut very short as soon as Toji shoots her through the head, completing his assassination. The anger that Geto unleashes here is in part because of the life that was taken, but also because because of the possible loss of his closest friend Gojo. They were the strongest after all. How could anyone be able to take down Gojo? Despite unleashing two incredibly powerful curses to attack Toji, the only damage he sustains is a lost ear and a small haircut. In fact, Toji defeats Geto with almost no difficulty and shows off that he's just a dude with no cursed energy whatsoever. Without getting his worm curse stolen, Toji took down two of the most powerful jujitsu users just like that. What's important to keep in mind here is the word Toji uses to describe himself, a monkey. And if he's at a lower level of evolution and still overcame the so-called strongest people, this sticks with Geto and makes him start to question his opinion of normal people around him. And when Geto finds Gojo back from the dead, he picks up Toji's abandoned cursed spirit that can carry weapons, because you know, Toji's dead and it needs a new owner. From the beginning, it's clear that Geto despises curses and especially having to consume them to be able to use their powers in fights. This wouldn't be a problem if curses didn't exist, if people knew what they were bringing into the world through their negative emotions. If normal people could fight their own battles, right? A year later, even with his mind in disarray, Geto does his duty of investigating and fighting curses. With Gojo now at the pinnacle of the jujitsu world, Shoko not taking on difficult missions, that leaves him alone by default. While he's battling with himself, Geto meets meets Yuki, a former star plasma vessel, and she jokingly suggests he kills every non-sorcerer. And of course, she means it as a hypothetical solution, and as someone with a grudge against society. Even so, Geto hasn't decided on the road he wants to take. He's still a good person. Not long after, Haibara, a younger jujitsu sorcerer and Nanami's partner, is killed while on their mission. 
The curse had been stronger than initially thought. This causes Ghetto's dark thoughts to return, and visions of his friends being dead from trying to fight off everything on their own. A minority against curses created by a majority. And this is when Ghetto gets sent to investigate a village. In this place, the people are convinced two young girls are the ones responsible for the events that happened prior, and even keeping them locked up in a cage. When Ghetto realizes that they can see curses, and have been both ostracized and punished for it, he loses any sense of responsibility he had towards the non-curse users. They don't deserve to be protected. They should just be eradicated if they can't appreciate the effort and the lives lost for their sake. And that's what Ghetto does. He kills 112 residents of that small village, freeing the two girls from their torture. And due to jujitsu regulations, Ghetto is now considered a wanted criminal that must be executed for his actions. Maybe if he had only killed two people, he still would have been okay. But over a hundred? Ghetto was sending a message. His choice was made. In Shinjuku, the first person Ghetto sees after the incident is Shoko, who asks a few questions and calls for Gojo right away. Ghetto doesn't deny what he's done and certainly doesn't feel any remorse, even after admitting he's killed his parents as well. In fact, he doubles down on his new ideals, mirroring the same aggressive opinion that Gojo had in previous years. Ghetto doesn't want to waste his time protecting the weak. He wants them gone. If they can't figure out the damage they're causing to people who can't see and control curses. For a brief moment, Ghetto considers that he would be able to get rid of the world of monkeys if only he had Gojo's insane abilities. It wouldn't be such a grandiose dream in that scenario. Ghetto turns his back, and with Gojo unable to finish him off like he was meant to, this leaves Ghetto time to not only put a group, but plans into place. It's at this point that Ghetto takes over a culty organization, where he rids regular people of their curses for a price. The money is nice, but the goal is to get as many curses under his control as he can, despite his help being appreciated and also lowering the amount of curses that jujitsu users have to take care of, the reasoning behind his actions is dangerous, not to mention the way he extorts rich people in exchange for protection from curses that are under his control. The very proximity of non-curse users turn Ghetto's stomach, almost more than the act of swallowing the curses that he takes from them. But it's all worth it, if it means never having to deal with a cursed spirit in the future. Eventually, Ghetto catches wind of a special grade curse attached to a new Tokyo Jiu-Jitsu High student, Akotsu Yuta. With or without the boy's compliance, Ghetto needs to get his hands on the cursed spirit named Rika. But before this, he wants to see what she can do and how strong Rika really is. So he tests the boy during a small mission in an elementary school by placing a curse there to attack the kids. When that isn't enough, he releases a semi-grade one level curse, the one that Inumaki was meant to remove at the shopping center, trying to force Yuta's hand. Oh, and he drops a secondary veil to block Ichiji from removing his own. All he gets for his efforts is Yuta's ID card, leaving behind traces of his curse energy that Gojo recognizes. Not long Long after Ghetto has left a trail, he and his gang drops in, literally, <laughs> from the sky to greet Yuta and the other jujitsu users around. While, while there, he tries to recruit Yuta, but ends up insulting him and getting the attention of a number of faculty members around, including his former best friend Gojo, though he threatens a war called the Night Parade of 100 Demons for two locations, Shinjuku and Kyoto. On December 24th, Ghetto's real goal is to get Yuta alone and forcibly take Rika from him. Ghetto sends out his posse to the locations as promised, but they're just there to stall, so he has time to steal Rika away. To succeed, Ghetto has to kill Yuta though. And that proves to be not only a difficult, but unreachable goal for our ambitious curse manipulation user. Sure, he defeats Maki, Inumaki, and Panda with not much effort, but Yuta is different. He's a part of Gojo's bloodline. Despite unleashing and combining every single curse in his possession, which is around 4,461, bringing out his own special great curse, forming a massive ball of cursed energy called Maximum Uzumaki, Ghetto can't surpass Rika and Yuta's bond and power. And when he's on his last leg, dragging himself away from the battle, in awe of what he saw Rika perform, 
he comes across his old friend Satoru. It's obvious from the situation that Geto knows where this is going. This is the end of the line for him. Regardless, he wants to make sure his family got away safe. But Gojo asks him the same thing he once did to Toji. Any last words? The result may be the same, but the effect it has on Gojo is vastly different. Unlike Toji, Geto never directly attacked Gojo and never intended to. He even gave his best friend the chance to end him before it got to this point. And at that point, we assumed Geto had died. But as we see in the beginning of season one, Geto returns, looking more like a Frankenstein monster than his usual overconfident self. But he stays in the shadows and makes sure that no one from Jujutsu High ever catches sight of him. Did Gojo not end his life after all? Or has Geto returned from the dead somehow? It wouldn't be the first time a character has escaped death. If you want to know the truth behind Geto's appearance, you'll have to watch the Shibuya arc in season two of Jujutsu Kaisen. But that's pretty much it for this one, guys. If you liked it, please give it a like and please subscribe if you haven't already. Have a great day and I'll see you in the next one.